Uh, hello, my name is Lily, and I'm a woman. And I'm here to talk about CADNAP, which is a low latency embedded, embeddable user mode TCP IP stack that we developed in Rust at Microsoft Research. And who are we? We're the Demi Kernel team. Our goal is to create an operating system for kernel bypass and um, accelerated network hardware, or accelerated hardware in general. Um, the code is MIT licensed, and it's available open source on GitHub. So why are we interested in DPDK? Well, DPDK, as everybody here knows, is a kernel bypass solution from Intel. Uh, we want to minimize latency. Um, DPDK offers diverse hardware support. And it's supported by Azure, which makes it a very practical target for us. Another question I've gotten is, why would we want to write another TCP IP stack? Well, when we researched existing solutions, we found out that most of them, well, all of them are uh, tuned for throughput. And we want to minimize latency. We'd like to get uh, one millisecond over, or one microsecond overhead. Um, we also want to create an easy-to-use platform for experimentations um, and customizations to internet protocols. And we want something that's embedded, for example, in a DPDK application. So what ended up being special about CatNIP? Well, first of all, CatNIP is low latency. Um, and we get memory and concurrency safety guarantees because we implemented it in Rust. Um, it's a fully deterministic library, and I'll go more into why that's important later. Um, we built it using stackless coroutines instead of explicit state machines. And to make it easier to program or develop, we developed a polling await async syntax that uses declarative retry policies. Uh, this is also cross-platform and MIT licensed, and we completed a prototype using one person within six months. Um, so here's an overview of the topics that I'm going to cover. Next, we're going to cover um, high-level design goals. Um, well, we want to support TCP IP on DPDK, as I mentioned. And our goal is to be low latency. We want we wanted to do something rapid development because it, it wouldn't do for us to spend three years um, to complete our research. And we wanted something that was embeddable. And we wanted something that was really reliable. Um, we wanted to produce a prototype that could be turned into something that's production ready, as opposed to being thrown out. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the design choices we made in pursuit of these goals. So. Why use Rust? Well, we got a memory safety guarantee, which means that we're not going to get seg faults or memory corruption. Um, Rust also guarantees that there's no data races in our concurrency, which is really useful. Um, it provides low latency memory management, um, which makes it a contender um, for systems programming, um, where C and C++ is normally used. Um, Rust has a high quality standard library, which uh, it's high quality just like C++'s standard library. It also has a high quality build tool and package repository. If you've got memory safety guarantees and no data races, it's, it's more likely that other people's packages that you pull off of the package repository are going to work as expected. Um, Rust also provides us an escape hatch, which was really useful for um, a new project. Um, if we find out that Rust doesn't do what we need it to, we can switch to the unsafe dialect of Rust and do things that we would normally need to use C and C++ for. Um, you can link Rust against C and C++ code, and that means that if you've got an existing system, you can probably take a portion of the system and rewrite it in Rust so that you can convert your system to Rust incrementally. Um, and Rust also provides rapid application development. There is a learning curve, but once you're over the learning curve, you, you move much more quickly. And someone asked me to provide sample code, so this is an a short example of what Rust code looks like. So coroutines, the nice thing about coroutines is they have low latency context switches, um, as opposed to kernel threads, which last I read, you've got a quantum of about 12 milliseconds, which is way too high for us. Um, coroutines use cooperative scheduling, and Rust, this is handled by the yield keyword. Um, coroutines ended up being a dramatic reduction in complexity compared to explicit state machines. And that's really useful for me because I don't really think in state machines. Um, I tend to think in uh, thread-like abstractions. Um, 
I was inspired to use coroutines by MicroIP, which was developed by Adam Dunkels. He uses something called protothreads, which are coroutines that only use global state. Um, not very easy to use, but it fits on a Commodore 64, which suggests that they're very simple. Um, there's no debugging support for coroutines, even though they've been around for a really long time. Um, not a deal breaker for me, but it does make the stack traces look kind of odd. Um, coroutines do not provide parallelism, and they will always be layered on top of kernel threads. Even if you've just got one thread, um, your coroutines are layered on top of it. And coroutines can provide determinism. So why is determinism important? Well, determinism, as many of us know, is a property of a function or a system that gives us reproducible results given the same input or a series of inputs. Um, and I think we're not doing ourselves any favors if we're not leveraging this property in concurrent systems. Um, like, I'm sure we've seen our share of unreproducible bugs and unreliable unit tests. And if we leverage determinism, we can, we can help a lot with these problems. Um, in terms of increasing or decreasing complexity, um, I thought about it and I think that determinism rather shifts complexity to different parts of the system, lowers it in one part, increases it in another, but doesn't actually change the overall complexity. Um, and now I'm going to talk about how we implemented it and my experience doing so. So what was my experience with Rust? Um, a lot of people are worried about the learning curve with Rust, and the way, the way I approach that is, like when you're talking about risk management, you want to talk about caution and fear. Good risk management is about caution. You know, there is a risk to a learning curve, but we're looking for an opportunity to overcome that learning curve so that we can improve our tool set. But if you're fearful, you'll never consider the risk of never improving your tool set. And technical debt builds up and builds up, and eventually you're buried under it. Um, another thing people are concerned about is whether or not the debugger is usable um, or the profilers, and I found that they were usable. The debugger will demangle symbols, the GDB debugger. Um, supposedly the Visual Studio debugger works too, but I haven't, I haven't actually tried that. Um, the profiler does not demangle names, but it's still usable. I was able to um, optimize a previous system I implemented in Rust considerably just using normal um, uh, kcache grind. Um, but when developing catnip, I discovered that the debugger wasn't really needed until I started integrating with C and C++. Then I needed the debugger. Um, once we connected it to a real network, there were only a small number of easily reproducible bugs, probably about five, in catnip itself. Um, there were no concurrency bugs, thanks to the guarantees, and also deterministic unit tests. Um, there were no memory corruption bugs in catnip. But I did spend a week chasing down a memory corruption bug in DBDK, um, which is fixed as of version 19.08. Um, but I think it highlights the, the, the risks you take when choosing like Rust versus C or C++. Uh, now, I also developed a polling await async system, which is, really sim which is really similar to what was just released by the Rust, um, Rust team recently. Um, and this syntax is known to simplify asynchronous programming, um, and it facilitates rapid development. So you see it, like, I first saw it in C Sharp, but it's, it's been ported to other languages like Python, I believe, and um, it's, it's become considered a very useful um, form of syntactic sugar for asynchronous programming. Um, the polling aspect of it keeps latency low. Traditional await async frameworks don't, don't do polling. They're event-driven um, and built on top of kernel threads. Um, the await async sy system was really easy to implement with Rust's fantastic macro system. Um, it's probably the best macro system I've seen in a language. Um, and then we implemented declarative retry policies. So, like internet protocols frequently specify retry behavior, um, exponential back off is a really common one. And if you're using state machines, it complicates your code considerably to implement the same retry policy in different aspects of the system. But with, um, with Rust, I was able to use off scheduler coroutines to generate timeouts. And then we just like specify exponential back off with some parameters to the macro, and the macro handles it. Um, it's not implemented in the coroutines at all. The macro handles it. Um, 
And as I mentioned earlier, there's meaningful overlap with Rust's recently released async .await runtime. Um, they have some optimizations um, that are really nice compared to what we've done. Um, we have some features that they're missing. So my hope is that there's a collaboration at some point in the future and we can switch over to their asynchronous system. So how do you go about preserving determinism? Well, it's important to be strategically deterministic. A fully deterministic program isn't really useful. Catnip's a library, and so we can say it's fully deterministic because we intend to embed it in a program that's non-deterministic, which in our case would be the library OS um, for um, demi-kernel. Um, so what do we do? We need to isolate the side effects that break determinism. So in the case of catnip, we've got time, which is explicitly specified by the caller. The caller is going to say, this is the time, do some things, and then specify again to catnip, this is now the time. And so the, the caller has complete control over how the timeline progresses. Uh, for entropy, we use a, we use a dedicated um, uh, pseudo random number generator that can be seeded with real entropy if you want real entropy. Um, but for unit tests, we take a hash of the MAC address of the peer, and that gives us, that, that gives us deterministic unit tests. Um, inputs consumed through function arguments as opposed to calling a function with a side effect. Output is emitted through an event system. We don't, we don't ever talk directly to the NIC. The, the caller asks catnip for events. One of those events happens to be transmit, grab the bytes off of catnip, and then, and then the library OS or the, the caller is what tells DPDK what to transmit. And then Rust doesn't have exceptions. Those, that's another side effect that we have to consider, although I don't think exceptions necessarily break determinism. Um, Rust doesn't have exceptions, which is kind of a disappointment, um, because I think d exceptions are really useful, but I don't think it's a deal breaker because of all the, all the advantages that we get from Rust. Um, some TCP errors are communicated through the event system, also some um, um, ICMP errors. And then the, the result is really high quality unit tests for timing sensitive behavior. Um, one of my colleagues even suggested that we could take traces of, um, of a series of packets that cause a problem in catnip, and then we can generate a unit test that reproduces that scenario exactly um, um, so that we can debug it and guarantee that it's permanently fixed. So being able to generate unit tests for um, concurrent systems seems really useful to me. Um, and now I'm going to talk about our evaluation. So these are the specifications for the machines that we used. Um, we're using Mellanox cards. Um, and we use an echo server and client for the benchmarks. The message size of the echo test is 64 bytes. So we're well, um, we're somewhere, we're well underneath the, the MTU size. Um, we spend an average of 25 nanoseconds in catnip per round trip. Um, but to, but in, one, of the, one of the things with DPDK is, at least the way we've written it right now, is that Rust has its own memory manager, and then DPDK has its own. And you have to use DPDK's me memory manager because the memory needs to be pinned. And so we ended up copying between DPDK and catnip to, to solve that. And it takes 25, 29 nanoseconds to do that. It takes, we spend less time in catnip than we do copying um, in C++ between the two, the, the, the two memory domains. Um, we have a solution to eliminate the transmit copy. Um, the, the solution to eliminate um, the copy when we receive packets is gonna be more complicated to deal with, but we think we've got a solution. And there's also related work um, to catnip. So as I mentioned before, we've got micro IP, which is a miniature TCP stack for Contiki. Um, I think um, I, don't, I think I think companies like Cisco contribute to that one, so it's still actively developed. They just got an they just got an IP6 stack added into it, and then there's FStack, LWIP, MTCP. These are all embeddable user mode TCP stacks that are optimized for throughput, and they're also built on top of kernel threads. We we really couldn't use them because of the latency requirements. Um, CSTAR is a NoSQL database that supports DPDK. It's got a backend. Um, ANS apparently stands for Accelerated Network Stack. I tried to go there, but there was a security error, so I really can't say more about it. Um, FSTAR is a verified ML-based programming language that we're developing at MSR. It's an example of like 
where we're going in terms of like from C and C++ to Rust and then what lies beyond. Um, F-star is intended to um, provide many more guarantees than just like safety and um, concurrency. And then to conclude, we're not done. Um, currently, it's just a prototype. It's missing a lot of features. Like, for example, I only implemented the features that were needed for benchmarking so that we could do a proof of concept. So, for example, I, uh, we terminate the TCP connection with a TCP reset instead of a fin. I haven't implemented fin at all. Um, so, in addition to implementing more features like congestion control, we need to implement more protocols. Um, we also want to parallelize the TCP stack. We've got somebody working on that already using a, a partitioning scheme. Um, we would like it to be more modular. Like I mentioned before, we want something that's a test bed for like experimental protocols and whatnot. Um, so we'd like to be able to take parts of the stack and dynamically replace them with other implementations. Just make it more module so, modular so people can tear it apart and put it back together. Um, and we love communities. We'd love like comments, criticisms, or contributions. Um, and it's available on GitHub at the uh, Demi Kernel site. And that's all I have. Any questions? Yeah. Oh. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Also, I love the, uh, the Commodore 64 reference there. It's uh, great to see that it's still re relevant uh, 30 years later. I'm sure Jack Jamil will be proud. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, just two questions. Um, I, I see you're open, open sourcing your work here. Um, do you have any potential uh, use cases in mind for catnip? Potentially, let's say, like mission critical applications or so forth. And uh, also, would you be able to speak to your thoughts as far as potential adoption by community of, of catnip and so forth, uh, along with Rust? Um. So in terms of use cases, we're fairly low level, and so we're more concerned about, um, like for example, Azure's um, our customer, um, and that's an inf that's an infrastructure provider, um, and so we we tend to think more in terms of like infrastructure than like concrete use cases. Um, regarding, uh, like, what was your second question again? I'm sorry. Uh, just curious if you'd be able to speak to you know. Um potential adoption for this tool. Um, well, like, also in terms of Rust as well, the language Yeah, is. so internet protocols are really complicated and there's a lot of work and so it's not something that I can really do myself. So in order for catnip to really go anywhere, it needs a community. Um, and hopefully we've made it so that it's enjoyable to work on as opposed to punishing. Um, so we're hoping that um, we can collaborate with the community in terms of develop, developing catnip, which means the community is going to have a say in what goes on. As far as like Rust adoption goes, um, like I, I would like to see Rust adopted more, um, because if we're going to build complex systems, they need to be built out of simple parts, simple and reliable parts. Another way of looking at it is it's like, if you're gonna build a skyscraper, like every level has to be able to support the level above it reliably. Um, but in my opinion, we're busy playing a game of Jenga all the time. Um, and I'd like to see us move past it as the computer science community and industry because I think we deserve to accomplish more. Um, but in order for that to happen, we need to change. Thank you. Hey, a question about latency. I see the, the goal here of uh, one microsecond. Uh, what's, what's the meaning here? It's uh, half RTT, what the application sees when it tries to send something. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm, I'm looking at the uh, goal. Goal is one microsecond overhead. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean overhead? Is it the half round trip time that the application sees like in a ping pong test? Whoa. This is the time we spend in catnip itself. Okay. So the rest of the time that it takes, the rest of the round trip time is essentially the time we spend in DPDK and the library OS. And the NIC itself and the rest and the of the- NIC itself and everything. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? 
Thanks a lot, Lily. That Thank was a you. nice presentation.